Uh, we're in the book of Ephesians. We've been studying the book of Ephesians for the summer series here. And in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, the theme of this whole section is really love and respect. Love and respect. Now, Christian marriage has always been countercultural. You just got to grab hold of that. Christian marriage has always gone against the flow of the rest of culture. It was true back in the Lord's time, in the, at the time when, uh, of the Jews of Jesus' day. In fact, we know that every morning a Jewish man would get up and he would thank God that he had not made him a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Mm. Divorce was rampant because women were not treated that well. There were two schools of thought in the Jewish community at that time. The one was called the Shammai school, where you could get a divorce only for one reason, that was sexual unfaithfulness on the part of your spouse. Then you could get a divorce. Anything else was just wrong and sinful. But the Hillel school also said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible tells us you find something that does not please you in that person, uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 24, then you can grant a bill of divorcement. So if she burns your toast at breakfast, that's enough. Out she goes. Woo. <laughs> and so, but divorce was really rampant at that time because there was not a high regard for the institution. All right. You go to the Greek culture back in the time of our Lord and time when the Apostle Paul was writing, prostitution was an essential part of the Greek life. There's no getting around it. If you read ancient history, you'll find that that is true. One person wrote it this way. We have courtesans for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. And we have wives for the purpose of having children. The view of marriage was like there were no rules. No rules. No commitment. Oh. Now, you go to the Roman culture of the time. The Roman culture was not much better. In Rome, in Paul's day, the matter was probably even worse. Seneca writes that women were married to be divorced and divorced to be married. In fact, Jerome mentions in Rome a woman who was married to her 23rd husband, and that she was his 21st wife. So it was a society where marriage Marriage was really not held up in very high esteem. It's in a culture like that, I think, that we now live. We now live in that culture, don't we? Look at The divorce rate in America is like this. 50% of first marriages end in divorce. The age has a little bit more to do with that. If you're a teenager, you get married today, your likelihood of being divorced is probably uh, like 60%. And if you live with the person before you get married as a teenager, it's like 80 or more percent likely to end in divorce. Whoa, that's our culture. 67% of second marriages, 74% of third marriages end divorce, according to the Institute of Professional Psychology. Our culture, the culture of the world, really has not changed, is what I'm trying to say. So when Paul writes what he writes in the book of Ephesians, he is writing going completely counter to the culture in which he lives because he's going to give us what it means to have a Christian marriage, not a secular community, cultural marriage of our society, but a Christian marriage, which is so different, so different. I'm jumping to the end of the chapter, chapter 5, last verse. It says this, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. That's why I call this passage Love and Respect. I wasn't the first one to do this. There's a very excellent book out called Love and Respect. And the author is uh, by a gentleman by the name of Egriches. Egriches. And he wrote this book, and it's an excellent book. I refer it as the, the, the best book I've read on marriage in a long time. And it's so refreshing. He focuses on the two aspects of love and respect. First of all, I want to say, though, individually, marriage for a Christian goes counterculture because he says, however, each one of you, I am not to do marriage like the world does marriage. 
I am individually to do marriage the way God wants me to do marriage. So I, as an individual, have to choose to go counter to my culture and stay true to my vows no matter what. Each one of you must also love his wife and must respect. Notice the words I got them under. Right? Must, must. It's not that I love my wife if she's really wonderful to me. And she is, most of the time. <laughs> and she's back there saying, uh, I'm, more, I'm, a, I'm nicer to you than you are to me. Yeah. Oh, I got, I got, we got something brewing already. And I, I ain't bar barely getting going in this message, right? No, it's not if the other person treats you well, then, then you... G Guys, what are you saying here? Even if your wife is not treating you right, you still have to, must, obligation, you must love your wife. He says to the wife, even if your husband is the lazy bum, he... All right, I'm, I'm not going to describe him anymore. Okay. My wife's back there saying, yes. I, 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 no. E even if you still must respect him, that's your role. That's your part. That's what God wants you to do. Now, I want to unfold all this. I want to unpackage this because Paul has something for us as Christians. You see, when we follow the Christian model and go counter to our culture, our marriages will survive the culture in which we live. But when we cave in and we don't go according to God's plan, we mess it all up. And that's what's been happening in our culture. As people are less and less going to church, being involved in church, hearing the Word of God, allowing the Word of God to saturate their lives, living it out in their lives, you've been seeing that their families are messed up, their marriages are messed up, because God's plan works. That's just the way it is. God's plan works. You see, what every woman wants, what every woman wants is love. Everyone wants love. If I were to ask how many women here do not want love, I don't think a hand would go up. Every now and then I do a trick question like that and somebody goes up just to be contrary. <laughs> Deep down inside, they want love. Now what every man wants, believe it or not, is not love. What every man wants is respect. 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 They want to be respected. That's exactly what the passage said. Husbands are, husbands are to love their wives, but wives, it doesn't say to love your husband. It says respect your husband, honor him. That's what it says. And when you do that, everything changes. You see, respect is man's deepest value. A survey was done some years ago. Not that many, maybe about 10 years ago. Time flies, but... When men were asked, if you were forced to choose to live with only one of the following, which would it be? Okay, you only, got, you only pick one of these. To be left alone and unloved by everyone. To be left alone and unloved, have nobody love you. Or to feel inadequate and disrespected by people. Which one would you choose? Which one would you rather? And the men, 74% of the men responded, I'd rather live without love than to be disrespected. Respect is man's foundational core. What he wants is to be respected. That's why it's hard for him to open up and share because he's afraid he might say something that will bring him down a notch and you won't respect him. I'd hate to goof up in what I say. So he keeps all closed up, clammed up. It's not, not that he doesn't know the stuff. He, not that he doesn't have feelings. He's just afraid to get them out there. Just afraid to get them out there. Why? Because he'd rather be unloved than to be disrespected. Now, what every man wants is R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? And you know this song, right? Oh, how many know this song? Oh, yeah. If I were to start singing it, you'd join right in with me. But you're safe. I'm not going to start singing it. I'd really butcher it. All right. And you know Aretha Franklin sang this song, right? You know that? All right. Everybody knows that. But do you know that she did not write it? Otis Redding wrote it, and he wrote it for his wife. What he wanted was a little respect from his wife. Isn't that interesting? Now, she sang it because of the women's movement, and women today are trying, they're, they're acting like what I want is what men got, 
But what they really want deep down inside is love. Not respect. That's what the guy wants. The guy wants the respect. The guy wants respect. Did you ever notice uh, you, you buy a card? Hallmark had this one about their, their cards, a commercial. The guy's going home. He realizes, oh, it's my wife's birthday. He's at the gas station. There's a Hallmark card stand there. Birthday. Picks it up. Signs his name on it when he's doing the, the, the credit card thing. Goes home. Gives it to the gal. And she reads it. Oh, every word. Oh, oh. And she just loves him like this. Oh, you must have really thought profoundly on all those cards of what to get me. You know why that card works so well? A woman wrote it. <laughs> That's right, a woman wrote it. Men don't go out writing all these ushy, gushy cards. We just look for one we think might match. We buy that card and we, we give that card to them. Yeah? And, 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 but her heart caves for that. No, no, women, if you want to... Don't buy a card for your husband. I'll tell you right now, don't buy a card. The card that says, I love you, because th that doesn't speak to him. You've got to make your own card, because all the women are writing the cards. They don't write the right cards for men. The right card for a man is, I respect you. So you, you get a blank card, and you start writing in there all the, all the things why you respect your husband, respect your man. You write that in there, and, and you see if he isn't just blown away. Because what he wants is not love. He wants respect. He wants respect. Just try it. It's an experiment. You, you can do that. You can do that. You see, Christian marriage is about respect. It's about respect. It's not that women want to be disrespected. No, they don't. But that's not their fundamental core thing. They want to be loved. Men want to be respected. So the Bible says that this respect that she should give to a man is a submissive uh, respect. Now, this word submission, oh my goodness, this one gets beat. People are beating this one to death. Um, man, this is one of those politically incorrect words to say. But I'll tell you what, not too long ago, I was submissive to a woman. <sighs> yeah. The verse before this says, submit to one another. Submit to one another. And, and submit, submit to your husband. All that means to submit is to place yourself under somebody else's authority or responsibility. So I'm driving along. There's these flashing lights behind me. <sighs> you know what that means, right? That means you pull over. I pull over. The officer comes to my window, and it's a woman officer. And she said, I want to see your driver's license. Oh, man, I coughed that thing up. Why? This woman's bossing me around. Why am I responding? I'm being submissive to this woman. Why? Why? Because she is a police officer. She wants to see my registration, man. I go in the glove box, I pull that thing out, and I give it to her. Why? Why? Because she is... A police officer. I'm very submissive. Submissive has nothing to do with equality and nothing else. All it means is you put yourself under someone else's responsibility or authority. That's all it means. That's all it means. Here the text is saying, women, respect your husbands. Respect them. The way you submit is you respect. You honor them. Don't be bossy, pushy, shouty. Don't Try to control them. What he's saying here is just place yourself in a place where you honor them. You honor them. You honor them. It goes on and says it's a Christ-like respect. If you read the passage, you'll see that it is so. But I want to talk about this Christ-like respect. The Bible says about Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word. Capital W on the Word means it's a name. It's the name of Jesus before he was born in the, of the Virgin Mary on Christmas Day. Before that, he was called the Word. He's pre-existent to his actual physical birth in the manger. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was with God. Jesus was God. You jump down to verse 14 in the Gospel of John, and it says this, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Some of the things I skipped over is he created all things. Without him was not anything made that was made. He's the creator, God. Jesus is the one. He's God. On Christmas, he's born of the Virgin Mary, and he lives a life. By the time he's 12 years old, Jesus is taken on a Passover down to Jerusalem, and somehow he gets lost. Mary and Joseph lose Jesus. They're two days out on the journey, going back home, and they say, well, hey, where's Jesus? Now, yeah, one time I left a kid at church in the nursery, and I went home, and my wife says, uh, where's Jonathan? I said, what do you mean, where's Jonathan? She said, well, you had him with you. Uh, Oops, I left him at church in the nursery. <laughs> he was sleeping. 
but it didn't take two days. Anyway, two days later, they arrive back, and they find Jesus talking with the professors, the PhDs, the THDs, the theologians of the day in the temple, and he's asking and, and giving answers, profound questions, because this is God as a 12-year-old boy standing there in their midst. Joseph and Mary, a little ticked. What in the world are you doing, Jesus? He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Well, that could almost be like a slap in the face to Joseph, like, you're not my dad, you know? And, and so, but then they told him, come with me. And this is what the text says. Then he, God in the flesh, went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he was ugh, subject to them. He was submissive to them. God Almighty put himself under the authority of Mary and Joseph. Wow. You know, that's what the word submission means. You just, it, does, it has nothing to do with how great or how small you are. It has, what role are you going to play? In our passage, it says, be Christ-like. Respect. Respect your parents. That's what, that's what Jesus did. And that's what he's saying. Wives, respect your husbands because if you do, you're hitting the most foundational thing that a guy wants. He wants to be respected. He wants to be appreciated. He wants to be, be liked in that capacity. It's a Christ-like respect. Christ-like. Submit yourselves to your husbands. But why respect? Well, the text says for or because the husband is the head of the wife, all right? The husband is the head of the wife. See, when you put yourself under the authority of someone else, they're ahead of you. They're, they're the head. The husband is the head. Even as he says Christ is the head of the church, we as the church, even Bethany Church, the pastor is not the top person around here, folks. Any of you can go by, bypass me anytime you want. You just go to God. Just go to God. Because Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we are following what he told and taught us to do. And that's who we follow. He is the head of, of the church. And he says he is the savior of the body. It's Jesus that died for you, not me. And he is the head of the body. And he is the savior. I don't save anyone. I can't. Jesus is the savior of the world, John chapter 4. Jesus is the savior of the world, not me. Why respect now, as the church submits to Christ, ideally, the church respects and submits to Jesus Christ in everything. That's ideally. But what is the church? It's not this building. It's the people. It's you. It's me. As we submit to Jesus Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. And then he has these two little words, in everything. Wow. Wait a minute. What if there's domestic violence? What if there's domestic disobedience? What if there's emotional abuse or physical abuse? Wait a minute. And you, you're telling me I need to submit to him? Now, if I go to the, the twin epistle Colossians, it's writing the same thing. He writes it this way. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Listen. Domestic disobedience, domestic violence, domestic uh, abuse, none of that is fitting in the Lord. No, no, we're not talking about, and we're not talking about somebody who's dominating and controlling because that's not the model here. The model are two people who are good-willed people. They've got good intentions. And, and the one is a wife where, where she is placing herself under authority as the head, her husband, and respecting him. And we have a husband who's out of love, willing to die for her. When you got that combination, that's what he's talking about. That, that's a situation in everything. Christian marriage has always been about love. You see, that's what every woman wants. The man wants respect. The woman wants love. In this passage, I've noticed there's a lot more written about the husbands on loving than there is about the women on respecting. I find that very interesting. It's kind of like because guys want this respect thing, they, and, and, and part of the, the guy thing is he's out on a hunt. It always amazes me all the things a guy will do when he's courting a gal. 
And once he's, he's on the hunt, he's on the hunt, man. I got to get myself a girl. Once he's got the girl, then he kind of slowly reverts back to the old ways. Anybody notice that? Or am I the only one? Yeah, you guys don't want to admit it. All right, anyway, husbands, he says, love your wives. This is it. Love your wives with an obedient love. This is a command. There's no options here. He just says, love your wives. Now, the word here for love is agape. It's the strongest word of love you can find in the, the Greek language. It means to sacrificially love. It, it, it means that you're going to love at great expense to yourself. You, you, you must love your wife. And then he says it's an unconditional love. He's not saying that you get to love her only if she's respecting you, but even if she's disrespecting you, you still have to love her. You know how I know that? Romans chapter 5 eight. But God demonstrated his agape love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were so despicable, vile, unlovely in our sin, God loved us unconditionally. Wasn't that a thing we could do to improve ourselves? We had to have the sacrifice of Jesus, and he provided that because he loved us. And Jesus died for us because he loved us. And so the passage here is about unconditional. You love no matter what. Just as Christ loved. How did he love? He gave himself up for her. He died. How unfathomable. I mean, he, he went to extreme lengths to demonstrate his love toward us. It's not that hard to show your love to your wife. I got a whole list of them here. You can see them, all those blanks that we're filling in on the page. You do that. Unfathomable. You go to whatever extent it is to show your wife that you love her. Eventually, she will respect you. You just wear her down. You just keep loving. You just keep loving. You just keep loving. Pretty soon she can't stand it anymore. <laughs> and she said, I, I got to respect this guy. He just never gives up. He loves me. You just love, love, love. And he gave himself up for her. Listen, you're willing to take the bullet. You're willing to die for her. One time I had a guy say to me, he said, man, I could die for her. It's living with her, but that's impossible. <laughs> Did you get the idea here? Would you die for her? When she knows that you're going to protect her to the giving your very life, you wear her down. You wear her down. And she will respect you. And that's what you want. You want the respect. It's a purposeful love because you do this for a purpose to make her holy. Now, holy, most people think it's some pious monk. You want to put her in a monastery somewhere, you know, in a nunnery or something like that. No, that's not the idea here at all. The word holy means set apart from all the rest to make her holy so that she is different from every woman on the planet because you love her and you have no eyes for any other woman. And she knows you love her. You, she knows you love her. Because you've made her holy. She's separate from all the rest. Cleansing by the washing of the water through the word. The word of God, it's got to work in you first before it'll ever work in her. So when you start living out the Bible, you know what? She respects that. She respects that. And she feels like he's loving me because he's a real Christian man, not a pretender, not a hypocrite. It's genuine. It's real. You wash through the water of the word. It's reciprocal. Listen, you do this, guys. You love her to present, and it says, and to present her to himself. Because when you do this, when you love her, when you love her, you're going to get that respect coming right back. It's coming back at you. When you really love her, it's, it's coming right back at you. It's coming back at you. He said to present her to himself as a radiant. Oh, man, she's, she's going to be beautiful. You see, the more you love her, the more beautiful she becomes to you. 
It works like this. The more you really open up and are transparent, honest, and share, here it is, your feelings and your emotions, the deeper she thinks the relationship is going. She doesn't want a relationship that is an inch deep and a mile wide. She'd rather have the one inch, a little bit of your time, but go really, really deep emotionally. She wants to know who you are inside. And when, she, when she's got that, she just radiates. She radiates. She brags about her husband to the other ladies. You can't believe my husband opened up to me, blah, 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 blah. Then they change subject real quick. I don't know how they keep track of all those thoughts. Without stain or wrinkle or any blemish. He's protecting her character. He's making sure that there's no gossip about her. He, he, he's protecting her. He's making sure that, that she is protected in his care and her custody. Listen, she's holy and blameless. She's set apart from all the rest. Oh, my goodness. It comes up a couple of times in this past. Really setting her apart. Making her feel special. It could be as simple as, hey, picking up your phone and calling her and just saying, I love you. My wife knows I don't like talking on the phone. If I call her, she thinks there must be emergency. She was on the ladies' retreat, so I tried this experiment. I called just to say, hey, I love you. She said, oh, he's doing this. She said, this is something wrong here. He never calls me because <laughs> all the other girls are around. But you know, I did call. I did say that. You know, you, it's to make the other person feel special, holy, set apart, wonderful, wonderful. It's obligatory in the same way men ought to ought to. You have an obligation, guys, to love your wives as your own body. You see, he who loves himself, loves his wife, also loves himself. What am I saying here? When, when I love my wife the way she needs to be loved, she wants to be loved, and, and I'm talking her love language, and I'm doing all that, she's going to give back to me the respect I need. She's calling it love, but it's really the respect I need. She's going to brag about me. She's going to talk about me. She's going to support me. She, she's going to be, pretty soon, you know, I'm going to be feeling really good about myself. And I'm going to say, hey, you better cool it. I mean, people are going to think I'm Superman. I'm not Superman, you know. But that, that just builds up. And that's what every man wants. He wants respect. And it comes by loving a wife. You're rewarded. When you love your wife, you're rewarded with her loving back with respect. With respect. Now, he says it's a reasonable love in this passage because he says that after all, here's logic, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. This is the bottom line. If you want to love your wife, you're going to have to feed and take care of her. But my wife's on a diet. He's really not talking about food. He's talking about feeding her soul, feeding her emotions, feeding her physical needs, taking care of her. That's how love registers. He loves me because he cares for me. He's, he's providing for all my needs. He loves me. And I'm not just talking about physical stuff. I'm talking about the emotional stuff as well. He's there. It's this, so he says, this is reasonable. This is what you should do. He says, for we are all members of his body. Now he's starting to shift gears for us. You see, we're all members of his body. The body is the body of Christ. Everybody who's believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior is placed into the body of Christ, which is called the church. We know that from earlier in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, last verse, verse 22 or so, it says that Christ is the head over his body, which is the church. So what he's saying here is, for we are members of his body. He saved us. It's reasonable because, bottom line, we are all one. Every one of us who is in Christ, we're one. We're one. There should be unity in the marriage. That's where he's going next. There should be unity, and that's exactly what he says. And he starts to quote the Bible. It's really cool. When the Bible quotes the Bible, Paul is quoting now back to Genesis when God created man, Adam and Eve in the garden, he placed them there, and God gives him this instruction. 
And this instruction is given for the reader. I know that because Adam and Eve didn't have a father and mother. So Moses wrote this for the reader. That's us. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. One flesh. The text goes on to say they were naked before each other and not ashamed. That naked is they were totally transparent and honest. There was nothing hidden in the relationship. They were totally open to each other. He says, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united, and the two will become one. You are one. The more you break down those barriers, okay, hiding truths from the other person, hiding feelings from the other person, and just, just exposing yourself, the stronger your relationship becomes. The stronger your relationship becomes. He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and he'll be united to his wife. So there's cutting the apron strings and now you are a new family unit and the two become one flesh and the result of one flesh is having offspring and offspring constitutes a new family. Now when they grow up, they do the same thing. It happens all over again. Moms, you got to cut the apron strings. Let your kids go. That doesn't mean they're not going to come back, but man, you're supposed to train them so that they're, they're Christians and they're following the steps of Jesus. And you've modeled what it is to love and respect. And they say, I won't settle for anything less. I want the same for my life. I want that for my life. After touching on that biblical passage, he makes a theological conclusion. He said, this is a profound mystery. Now, mystery, as we've talked about before, in the English language means you don't know what's going on. But in, in the word mystery in the, the Greek language means that this is now an open sacred secret. Something was secret before, but now it's open. Now we know it. It's con it was once concealed, but it's now revealed. It's out in the open. He's saying, listen, this is a profound mystery. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm letting something out of the bag. That's what he says. I am talking about Christ. This whole time I've been talking about husband and wife. And he says, oh, no, 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 don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about the church. Christ is the husband. You are the brides. Every one of you, if you know Jesus, are the bride of Christ. He said, I'm talking about your relationship with Christ. I believe that God ordained the marriage institution so we can have a taste in a good marriage of what the relationship is supposed to be like between Christ and me. Personal, intimate, sharing all. All the things that go on in a marriage, a good marriage. Is a type of the relationship you can have with Christ. I'm talking about Christ and the church, us, we, the people. That's what he's talking about. What I've been saying is that this love that we're talking about is countercultural. What I'm talking about here is not what the world offers. You know that. World offers pff, crazy stuff. You watch a movie the other night, a couple meet. Meet in the bar, decide to go home. Next thing, very same, just met them 10 minutes ago. They're in a sack together. This is not marriage. This is immorality. This is not love. This is carnality. This is, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. That's countercultural. So where do I go from here, you ask? Well, marriage is not for everyone. What? No, marriage is not for everyone. The Bible tells me that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say this, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. It's good to be single. Our culture says, no, man, everybody, every single person I know says, people are trying to set me up. Why? Well, they think I'm unhappy. No, you don't. I know a lot of single people are very happy, and I know a lot of married people are very unhappy. You know what I mean? You're getting the picture here. He's saying, listen, I say to them, stay unmarried as I am. The following verse says, but if you can't contain yourself, you found someone, 
He says, get married. He says, if, 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 you're, if you're living with the person or you're having sexual relations with the person, he said, if you can't control yourself, get married, for it's better to marry than to burn. Now, theologians this debate. Does that mean burn with passion inside because lust is always there? Or does it mean burn in hell? It doesn't matter to me which way you take that. The admonition is, don't live together without being married. You're not supposed to have sex. That's immorality. Sex is beautiful according to the scriptures. It actually tells me so in Hebrews that is undefiled. You, you can't defile it when you're married. Two, two lovers, okay? It's beautiful. It's like Jesus is there blessing it. But when you're unmarried, it's unholy, it's unclean, it's immorality, it's wrong. He's, so where do I go? Listen, he says, stay single if you can, but if you can't, get married. And if you get married, he says, listen to me, you think married's going to be a piece of cake? No, it's not. <laughs> Those who marry, not might, but will face, what? Not a few, many troubles in this life. You know why? You see, some people tell you, when you get married, oh, you, you do divide everything in half. I only have to carry half the load, but I also get twice the problems. Twice the problems. You will have many troubles, and I want to spare you of this. He's saying, whoa, whoa. See, for, for this to work out, single or married, either way, marriage Singleness, it only works if you've got Christ in your life. It's kind of like a big triangle. Jesus is at the top, husband, wife. The closer they draw to Jesus, the closer they draw to each other. If one goes further from Jesus while one goes closer to Jesus, they're still farther from each other. If it goes the other way, and if they both go... They grow further from, but the more we grow towards Jesus, the closer we become to one another. We become to one another. God has an unbeatable combination in this passage. This is just un unbeatable. A husband who loves his wife, he really loves his wife, it's easy for her to respect him. Wow. And a wife who respects her husband is a woman that's easy to love. When you start doing this, instead of having a downward spiral in your relationship going down, 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 you have an upward spiral going up, 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 up. That's the way God intended it. He wants us to have redeemed relationships. So, I'm challenging you. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, Respect your husbands. With that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for all those today who recommitted themselves to this foundational truth of having a Christian marriage. We pray, Father, for the husbands that they will truly love their wives even as Christ loved the church and that the wives will submit and honor and revere, our Lord, that they will respect their husbands even as the church should do so to Christ. An unbeatable combination. When we do this in harmony together, the relationship grows and grows and grows and strengthens and strengthens and strengthens. And God, you are blessing, blessed and we are blessed by you. So for every married couple here today, I pray that both the husband and wife will fulfill the role that you've given them that they might see the blessing of God upon their union. Lord, for those who are single, and some, Lord, you will confirm that it is better to remain single. Others, Lord, they still have their eyes open. May they keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, just running towards Jesus. And every now and then, Lord, just look to the side, see if anyone else is running that way to whom they might be attracted. Lord, put that person in their life where they will find them, and so that they can find another believer, a Christian spouse. If that's your plan for their life, Lord. But always pursuing the relationship with you first. We know, Lord, that when we pursue you first, 
you will bless. Bless us in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.